Andrew Oak has been with us before. Andrew is the author of The First Lady's Man. He is, uh, well, he is The First Lady's Man. He's the author of Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies. And now he has volume two out, and we want to talk about that. He's tweeting at First Ladies AO. Andrew, welcome back. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, it's good to be here with you, Tim. So so I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, did you really want Hillary to win because you wanted to sort of break new ground <laughs> and, and call it something other than just the First Ladies and Guy? Or did you want uh, Donald Trump to win so you wouldn't have to change the title of the book? It's a fantastic question, Tim, and we <laughs> yeah. we, we we did we did discuss it a little bit uh, in in past appearances about the the possibility of that first gentleman and the fact that most people were surprised to realize that he would not be called anything other than President Clinton because you mm-hmm. would have President Clinton and President Clinton. It, honestly, this was a win win situation for the first ladies' man. Donald Trump and Melania <laughs> Trump are very colorful to say the least, and. And a Clinton administration, a Hillary Clinton administration, would be equally, if not more so. So I really thought that there was, I couldn't make a bad call here. And in volume two, there is a very interesting little side note in the Hillary Clinton chapter, and it's called What If? And it goes down what my thoughts are based on my research, my travels, and all the other places I've gone and first ladies and administrations I've studied, what a Clinton administration would like, look like with the first first gentleman. And it's, it's, it's very interesting to consider. Mm, it still is, too, because any first lady who has uh, now or any first lady, if any one of them decides to run for office down the road, although Melania Trump can't run for president because she's not American born. And I think she's only the second first lady to be non-American born, right? That is correct. Adams was the other one. Yep, yep. Louisa Catherine Adams, born in London in February of 1775. Her father was a colonist and just got caught on the wrong side of the Atlantic during the Revolutionary War. So she grew up in France. And um, back then, that was uh, considered by the Adams family and a lot of people to be kind of a a, a political... uh, uh, Albatross it was, was looking at, you know, we were trying to establish our own identity and be this new country and bringing a foreigner in to the White House wasn't wasn't looked on as as something that that, that maybe John Quincy Adams would do or would work in his favor. And, you know, now I kind of think it gives us a, a more worldly perspective. We've clearly got our identity and our mark and our position in the world. And I think and I said from the very beginning, even before Trump was the nominee, that Melania Trump has has a very unique opportunity to give that international flair and help us on the international stage and be more of like a Jacqueline Kennedy than than maybe the the best Truman that she's been compared to as well, that, that she's kind of quiet and stays behind the scenes. But I think, you know, in meetings and, and, and knowing what to say and knowing what to wear and, 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 and having that sort of international grace, I think it works in her favor. You know, Jackie, uh, you mentioned Jackie Kennedy. Jackie Kennedy used to speak French once in a while. And I wish that um, Melania Trump would actually speak a different language in public once in a while, just because I think, you know, English is not her native language. She right. speaks it well, but but there are other languages she speaks probably even better. And I, I just kind of wish it'd be kind of interesting because, you know, it's just, it's an international flavor I'd like to hear. 100 percent, Tim. And you're absolutely right. That plays so well. And that was one of Jackie's. Mar- she spoke Spanish too. Jacqueline Kennedy spoke a couple different languages, maybe not fluently, but she was always very, very careful to learn these types of catchphrases and these greetings and things. And she would step out on the stage in foreign countries and be a huge hit just because she tried, just because she said it. She tried to assimilate and not be this big American presence saying, hey, we're American and look at us being American. It's like we're here to get along and I'm going to say something in your native language. And it it was an it just greased the skids, man. It was it was a very, very pleasant way to look at this pleasant woman who always knew how to dress and always knew how to appear and always matched her husband perfectly for the occasion. Jacqueline Kennedy speaking of. And and it worked very well for her. So that that's an excellent call on your part to say that we yeah. we need to see these languages hear these languages come out of her. John F. Kennedy said, you know, I'm a, I'll be known as the man who accompanied Jackie Kennedy to Paris uh, because she made such a hit with Charles de Gaulle. Yeah. Uh, once again, I wanted to let's let's talk about the book. Unusual for their time on sure. the road with America's First Ladies, Volume Two. Where what is Volume Two? And, and just sort of set the stage for Volume One for people who haven't read it or, or seen the book. Absolutely. Volume One is Martha Washington through Ida McKinley. It's the 1700s and 1800s. So Volume One concludes with the assassination of McKinley and uh, Edith Roosevelt and Theodore Roosevelt moving there family from New York down to Washington, D.C. to be the first family. And and it's interesting. I was thinking about this this morning driving in, and 
Martha Washington, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's where you have to start. It's a great start. But volume two, starting with Edith Roosevelt, Edith Roosevelt is such a remarkable woman and such a strong woman and such a force. And not only did she create the East Wing and the West Wing and architecturally, physically change the White House, she changed the White House from a very dull and quiet and, and almost somber McKinley administration. They lost their two daughters very, very early. And she had um, what we can only guess to be epilepsy. She was very involved and very public, Ida McKinley, but it just, it wasn't that active, happy White House that the Roosevelts brought in. So to start off volume two, which goes all the way through Melania Trump, I mean, we don't know as much about her as we do most of the other first ladies because we just haven't had the time. And we don't know as much about Michelle Obama in that research wise, she doesn't have a museum. Uh, theirs doesn't open. The Obama Museum doesn't open until 2020 in Chicago. So the the last presidential library I was able to to, um, to visit and study and research and go behind the scenes in was Bush 43 in Dallas, which is fantastic. So the Melania chapter and the and the Michelle Obama chapter in the book are more sort of what we've seen and what we know and what we can think about for the future and what does it set the stage for their legacies to be. Um, but Speaking going of which, uh, yeah. just real quick, uh, that you, you mentioned obviously with history books and so on and, and libraries. And what is it access like for the living first ladies? I mean, what what kind of um, I don't know conversations have you been able to have if if you've been able to have any at all? Because they're pretty tight lipped about a lot of these things. They are. Uh, uh, the, the, I was I was the traveling producer for the C-SPAN series First Ladies Influence and Image, and for that series, the living first ladies that were interviewed are Rosalind Carter. Barbara Bush and Laura Bush. Um, Nancy Reagan was unfortunately just past her public prime right. at that point. She was she mm-hmm. was she was really staying in, um, uh, which which we respected and, and completely understood. Uh, Hillary Clinton was was gearing up for you know the campaign of her life, so she decided to have a conflict at the last moment that may or may not have been legitimate. But I mean, I, I completely understand. She was under the microscope like no one else at that point. So. I have had the opportunity to speak with and meet Laura Bush in the past in an unrelated topic when I was working for Channel One and had done some malaria uh, pieces in in Mozambique and South Africa. So um, I was able to meet and talk with her. But the other first ladies were being interviewed while I was in their hometowns and while I was at their museums and, and libraries or their husband's museums and libraries. And the, the schedule, the shooting schedule, the production schedule for the C-SPAN series was insane. And I, it was me with seven bags of gear traveling across the country, going to every home, library, church, school, museum, train station for every first lady. And it was so tight, the schedule, that I was watching the Nixon show live, the Pat Nixon show live, while I was sitting in Plains, Georgia, having just shot all the material for the Carter show. So there really wasn't much wiggle room. Um, and so while these interviews with the actual first ladies were going on, I was researching their lives before and, and after the White House at their libraries. But but all of the libraries and museums could not have been more accommodating. Of course, who's got a better name than C-SPAN when it comes to this kind of stuff? So the yeah. access was was just remarkable. I, uh, I, w- I wonder, I wanted to touch on one of the, the women in this, um, in this, obviously in this period you're mm-hmm. talking about. Yeah. Because some people say she may have been the first uh, woman president. Uh-huh, yes, that's Edith Bowling. That's Edith. You know, Woodrow Wilson's first wife, Margaret, died in office, then he remarried, and then Edith comes in. Then he has a stroke, and by a lot of accounts, she pretty much ran the show for a while. That, that's that's one hundred percent true. You know, a, a lot of these things, you know, urban legend and and the things that get romanticized and exaggerated over time. Uh, I learned it from number one. You know, Martha Washington. She wasn't out, you know, fixed uh, mending uniforms of revolutionary soldiers, and she wasn't mopping the brows of the of the men dying in the field. She was she was running the the general's home and and the official events and 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 things for him in the house as as any woman of the of a stately estate or pl- plantation would do but but when i got to the uh to the wilson museum in stanton virginia um i saw papers from wilson's doctor and it is i i am 100 percent convinced that she was the first unofficial female president nothing got to wilson's eyes or even into his bedroom 
that did not pass through her eyes. Now, this was done even before his stroke. They had a box. It's a metal box, and it's at the Wilson house in Georgetown where they both retired and, and ended up uh, dying in that house in Georgetown. It's a fantastic museum and facility that you, anyone should get to that can. There was a metal box, and they would put all the official papers in there at the end of the day, and Edith and President Wilson would go up into the residence and sit, and she would go through them. She was privy to all this. And she's not the first lady, first first lady to have this kind of act. Access. Rosalind Carter did it. Bess Truman did it. M- Martha Washington did it. I mean, this is what these women do many times, most times for their husbands. But when Wilson had the stroke, the plan was for him to retire. It was it was plotted out and documented that Wilson and his doctor were going to march him out before Congress because no one knew he had a stroke at the time. He just told the, the country they, they 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 staged some 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 questionably accurate or or or. or uh, interviews with with President Wilson's that may or may or not happened, and and only very very close people knew that Wilson had a stroke. He told the country that he was tired and needed to rest, basically, and people accepted that. So he it's... went he went locked down behind closed doors. And Edith Wilson, it said in the papers that the president's plan to retire does not please Mrs. Wilson. So it's, she um, she told him not to it's, retire. It's, it's an amazing story about the, I mean, you read about the way that she, the little subterfuge that she did, yeah. darkened rooms and so on, recovering, and a lot went on during the time. Um, and, you know, we emerged, so I guess we're bigger. <laughs> we're, the democracy is bigger than something like that. Uh, but one of the great stories of these first ladies, Andrew Oak with us again. The book is unusual for their time, On the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 2. I want to get your take on on when you think the role of the first lady actually changed, because a lot of people point to, um, you know, um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Right. Because she was, I am my husband's legs. Sure. Kind of thing. She went, used to travel around for FDR. And of course, he was president for, he was elected for four terms, served three plus part of a fourth term. Uh, Bess Wallace, very different, the one who followed uh, Bess Truman. She became, um, you know, she was much more introverted. But. In that time, since Eleanor Roosevelt, I think there's been a changing in an expectation. But you give us your take on when it became something that, that first ladies were supposed to do more than just entertain and do things. They almost have, always have to now kind of have a cause. They absolutely do. And, and, and that's something that I always stress is that we have to understand that these women, arguably the most influential and powerful, unelected and unpaid women in the world. Uh, and, and soon that will be, you know, a, a man who is married to a, a female president, as we started out discussing. But first ladies have been doing this kind of thing from almost the beginning. Um, the, the, the first one that pops to mind, there could not be an Eleanor Roosevelt if there wasn't a Lucy Hayes. Lucy Hayes, uh, wife of Rutherford B. Hayes out of Fremont, Ohio, up by Sandusky in the Great Lakes. She, when Rutherford B. Hayes, after the Civil War, when he was governor, she went out to mental institutions, VA hospitals, orphanages, and she would report back to her husband and say which ones were good, which ones were not good. She hosted uh, veterans uh, picnics, reunion picnics on the lawn of Spiegel Grove. She was a... a, a she was a, a, a first lady for the people. And and you could go back even further. Uh, it wasn't as big or as official, but but uh, Harriet Lane um, for President Buchanan, his niece, the only the only uh, president never to marry. Um, Harriet Lane was extremely influential, and it was mainly because of the great loss in her life. That's how she even becomes the ward of, of uh, President Buchanan as his niece, because her parents died, her brothers and sisters died, everyone in her life died. And she was educated and, and sent all around Europe. And when she got back here, that European influence and that, that uh, elegance and things that she learned afar, she turned that into what is now the National uh, Gallery of Art uh, because of the great loss of her children and people in her life. She started what is now the children's ward uh, of Johns Hopkins. Before her, Dolly Madison was doing things for orphans of the Revolutionary War. I'm not 100% sure if she was doing that while she was First Lady or afterwards, but another one of Dolly's big projects after her husband died was to help and take her husband's notes and document the notes and workings of the First Continental Congress. That was supposed to fund her retirement after her husband's death. So... These women, you know, unusual for their time is is kind of a an interesting title for this whole project of, of mine and, and the books and speaking programs and things. But it is so absolutely true that from the beginning, these women have been so unusual for their time, not necessarily between themselves in this unique sorority of women to which they belong, but within 
other women of their time, other men of their time, children. I mean, any, these are extremely unusual women that have rose to the occasion and taken an unpaid, unelected job to the next level for the betterment of human beings. It, it's, it's truly remarkable to, to, to learn about these women outside of the White House before they were first ladies and, and, and afterwards. It, their, their lives are just truly remarkable. There's somebody who fills that bill pretty well, I think, Andrew, and it's it's, it's funny because you say, I think she in the book you say that she's the first first lady you remember, and that's Betty Ford. Mm-hmm. She was a dancer, born Betty Ann, well, Elizabeth Ann Bloomer, but I think a lot of people remember her because she took stands that a Republican woman would not have been expected to take when her husband became president, Gerald Ford, obviously, after Richard Nixon resigned, he was vice president, he became president. The only president, by the way, never to have been elected either president or vice president, so, but, but she took positions on things like abortion, um, uh, you know, breast cancer, just addiction, all yep. of these things. Phenomenal. And, you know, this this was definitely not expected at the time. No. And, and, and it's funny, Tim, you, you hit one of the greatest realizations of my entire journey so far. And it didn't happen until I was writing volume two and I got to the Betty Ford chapter. And it's almost like, I mean, you know, you'll write like a script for the show or something and you read it in your head and it's different than when you read it out loud. And when I went back with this research and went through my notes and wrote the actual chapter, halfway through the chapter, I realized very, very surprisingly of what you just said is that Gerald Ford was never elected vice president or president. Therefore, Betty Ford, and she said this, she said this openly in 60 Minutes interviews, she had no business being first lady. And if people didn't like it, they could just, you know, pound sand or kick her out or do whatever. She didn't really care. And she, Gerald Ford went on after the, after his administration to say like more times than not, he was sided with, with his wife, Betty, on a lot of the topics that did go against his party. But he said, even if he didn't, it wouldn't have mattered because Betty was her own woman. And this is, I mean, this is going back a few a few years, you know, when when they were in the White House and issues that we're still struggling with today. But here's what I realized beyond anything about Betty Ford. And this is why I make a very, very bold statement in the book and here with you today. Betty Ford is most likely or arguably the most influential woman, first lady of the past, present and future of first ladies. And here's why. There's no one on human there's no human being on planet Earth that has not been affected directly or indirectly with cancer or addiction. And without Betty Ford, the playing field would be much different on curing those things. That's just wow. that's just what it is. And you, you, you can't pick another first lady that has been more directly or indirectly influential to every single human being on Earth because of cancer and addiction. I um it was very different when uh, when we had, uh, you know, Rosalind Carter was different in her own way, but N- Nancy Reagan, very different, too, obviously. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it was kind of weird because the, the cultural changes between the Carters and the Reagans went from the homespun Georgian to the Hollywood, you know, and people think about Hollywood, they think of Donald Trump, the TV star, but the Hollywood side of things, because both uh, President Reagan and, and Nancy Davis Reagan have been actors. Um, and so... It was a totally different world. Remember the, the China? Yeah. Uh, oh, and for sure. Of course, all of those parts of the presidency. I just, it's, it, it, you know, quite frankly, reading this stuff over, I remember all of these first ladies for the most part, not not all of them all the way back to uh, Best Truman, but but I do remember some of them. And I remember the whole thing about Nancy Reagan, the president would make people stand up and ask questions, uh, raise their hands at the press briefings. It was, it was sort of a return to, um, I don't know, a, a sort of a presidential expectation that was long since gone it had disappeared she wasn't even shy about that she openly said she wanted to return the white house to a type of elegance that it was there during the kennedy administration which I, the the comparisons between jacqueline kennedy and nancy reagan are are remarkable in in their attitudes and what they did but the difference is jacqueline kennedy was young with young children Nancy Reagan was older without young children. That alone sets a different stage for the perception of the public. We are more accommodating to a younger, more attractive mother than an, an older uh, first lady without these children. Um, 
what 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 Nancy Reagan did the, well the China thing is so funny because it's just it's ridiculous and 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 the public opinion is just wrong uh, she got so blasted for buying that new China and everyone thought oh this fancy Hollywood chicks coming in and buying all these fancy dresses and China and this well if she didn't and she looked like a slouch or she was using someone else's China they would have said she doesn't know how to be in the White House or doesn't know how to serve a proper dinner or this that and the other but the fact of her spending too much money it would it was wasn't even taxpayer dollar. It was it was donators, the same type of donators that bought Wilson his retirement home and 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 Grant his Galena home in in Illinois on the hill after the Civil War. I mean, it's the the precedent is there. It's been going on, and almost every first lady from Monroe, the Monroes were the first administration to have an official White House china set the rest of the before that uh they would just bring their best dishes from home but almost everyone after that had an official white house china you, it's it's something that's expected to do um so so and and i can remember i'm i'm old enough to remember uh uh reagan saying i don't i don't make any decision without running it by nancy well mm. that's been happening since since almost uh george washington and then clinton comes along very soon after and says you get two for one I, what's good for one first lady is is rarely good for another and what's bad for <laughs> one first lady is rarely bad for another because we have such short term memories we're fickle and we're we're hypocritical as as a mass mob mentality but but yeah nancy reagan was a very elegant well dressed beautiful first lady that wanted to return that proper elegance and that esteem to the White House that people did enjoy that that sort of casual attitude and you know Willie Nelson's running through the White House and hanging out and, and on on the rooftop and sleeping in the Lincoln bedroom and all that and and people did enjoy some of that relaxed atmosphere but then they were ready for a change and and Nancy Reagan was trying to instill that change and, and she got blasted for it in many instances Andrew Oak with us the first ladies man he's the author of unusual for their time on the road with America's first ladies volume two and speaking of which before we run out of time I want to make sure that we mention that this is on the road and it's a lot more than just the stories, which are great, which you've been talking about. But, for example, you have these little travel notes. Uh, for example, when you were checking into a hotel, I think it was when you were on the way to George W. Bush, you you um, you were saying hello to a fish. Oh, yeah. And they asked if you wanted one in your room. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that has really very little to do with it. It was just kind of a funny yeah, thing. No, this that is part was, of what you do in the book. It, yeah. It's, well, you know, it, it, it people along the, along the journey when I was doing before I had any idea of being the first lady's man or writing a book or doing public speaking on this or, or can even consider myself remotely an expert. I was just a television producer doing a job. These women spoke to me so clearly and their stories needed to get out and be more, more commonly known and frequently told. And I just, the, 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 the substantial influence that they had from very the very first one all the way through to modern times so i was enjoying myself and i was becoming this first ladies man whether i knew it but i was a guy with seven bags of gear that pinballed all across the country by myself living out this lifestyle on facebook on social media and people wanted to know where what hotel are you staying at how did you get there did you drive did you take a train where do i eat when i'm in independence missouri you know i mean there it's it's a travel log it's a history lesson it's a journal. The books, people seem to find that they're fun because it's not stuffy. It's it's just sort of a fun little journey where I learned about these women that were just so remarkable in 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 constructing, you know, one of the most powerful countries in the history of the world, nations that, that now that now runs the joint. And people, you know, I mean, without Martha Washington, if George Washington doesn't marry Martha Washington and how he she advanced him financially, socially, uh, intellectually, we're not on Sirius XM radio. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not sitting in America. We're not here in Washington, D.C. I'm not from Maryland. The whole and that means that means no Apple computers, no McDonald's, no Coca-Cola, no Harley Davidson, no global world no, economy. No, that would have been Harley Davidson. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I would have kept them in business just <laughs> for all the T-shirts. What was that, that uh, picture I saw of you? Was a, it was a it was a really chopped up motorcycle? Was that in front of the White House? Yeah. Well, it's it's <laughs> yeah. That is my that's my motorcycle. It's is it's it? A, it's okay. A, it's a historic uh, Harley Davidson Sportster, uh, 1988 that I've that I've done uh, extensive work on and do a, do a lot of traveling and running around on and. 
and and I wanted to create this historical uh, sense. So so that is me in full color in front of an old nineteen. 1913 or 1914 White House. So the the idea of it with the photoshopping in there is to make it look like I just rolled my chopper back in time and 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 take people across this journey and it gives people a sense of the of the kind of guy I am and the kind of journey that we're going to take and it's not going to be stuffy and everyone's going to have a good time and I'm going to tell you where to get a foot long lobster roll in Maine and and I'm going to tell you where to get the best hot dog in Withville, Virginia and we're going to have a good time doing it. Bill and Ted and Andrew's excellent adventure. <laughs> that That's is, all that part is, of that. that I, I, just to finish up, the, the the thing I mentioned about the fish, basically Andrew was checking in. I think you were on the way to interview George. Well, it was. You're George absolutely. Bush, and you asked about, you were talking to the fish, and the guy says, well, you know, I can get one of those in your room. Well, no, thanks. Then you went to dinner. Then you came back and you said hi to the fish because it gets lonely on the road. And they said, really, we can get you one in your room. And I'm like, okay, this is not... Um, uh, the, uh, this is not the Motel 6 you're staying No, it was crazy. It was, it was a, it was a Kimpton right there in Dallas that's basically across the street from the 43, uh, museum and library there. And I'm checking in and the guys get in my room and making my little, you know, key card and everything. And there's a goldfish. So I looked at the goldfish and I said, Hey man, you know, how you doing little fish? And I kind of wiggle my finger at it. And the guy said, we'll have one in your room before your bags are up there. I said, no, no, seriously, I'm, I'm here for less than 24 hours. I had a 6 a.m. in time at the loading dock at Bush 43 because a lot of these places want to get you in and out before you're messing with the experience and, and, and people spend a lot of money and travel great distances to go to these places. And I don't want to taint their experience. I want to do my thing and get out as well. And you're, you're absolutely right. I, I, I declined. I went up in my room, threw my bags down. I was starving because I'd just driven in from College Station all halfway across Texas where I was studying his, his, uh, George's mom. And uh, and I went and had a really nice meal there in the hotel, and I just wanted to get to bed. And I came walking through the the lobby again, and and again I said hello to the goldfish. And the dude the 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 was in the back room, and he came running out, and he goes, I, "I seriously, I can have one of these in your room." I said, "No, really, I have fish at home. I'm not going to be here for more than more than twelve hours from now. I greatly appreciate your hospitality, but you can keep the fish right there on the on the front desk." And we all had a chuckle about it. Well, you can read about that as well as other uh, travel notes, but also about the First Ladies. Again, the book is unusual for their time on the road with America's First Ladies, Volume 2, the author, Andrew Oak, the First Ladies Man. Andrew, thanks uh, again for coming in the studio, and uh, and pleasant, uh, pleasant, and good luck with Melania in, in case you get that interview down the road here. No, I appreciate it, Tim. It's always a blast to come on here with you. Come on any and every time. Have a great holiday season, and thanks for having me on. You too. It's perfect. Just in time for Christmas, folks. There you if go. If you want to get it. Don't forget, you can get a, to a hold of Andrew. He is also tweeting at First Ladies Man. That is the numeral one, ST Ladies AO, at First Ladies AO. Instagram account, at First Ladies Man. Andrew Oak, the author of First Above the Book, Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 2.